Well, before we dive into our episode three of the Roger Corman Fantastic Four mini series we've got coming out for Wizards the Podcast Guide to Comics, some really exciting news was announced today on the Marvel Investors Roundtable Zoom call, whatever. So Stephen is here to join me to kind of fill us in on what was announced today. So Stephen, what do we got? Well, they announced many projects, many big Marvel projects, but the one that made me scream in delight <laughs> where, while I was sitting next to my wife, where I just like grabbed her leg and was like, oh my God, it's happening, it's happening, <laughs> is when they started to build up. We're going to be telling a story about Marvel's first family. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> so yes, Marvel will, will definitely now be producing a Fantastic Four movie. Crazy. I, I mean... The, so I saw that it's going to be directed by John Watts, who's doing yes. Spider-Man, who did the, you know, the, the Far From Home, Homecoming, mm-hmm. you know, Home Alone, Spider-Man 3, whatever they're going to call it. Toby um, needs to buy a new home. Yeah. <laughs> so pay him the money. Exactly. Oh, man. Yes. So that movie's stacked, and they're filming that right now. So I guess he's going to finish that movie and dive right into Fantastic Four. I guess so. He's a, he's a Marvel guy now. He's their go-to. So. He's I, all I cl- in. Clearly, like, you know, they're showing how, how excited they are for this and how seriously they take it if they're, giving, if they're giving it to John Watts, who's kind of directing, you know, their flagship yeah. title besides the Avengers. So he, He's the new Russo brothers, apparently. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, there was some speculation that Peyton Reed would get it, who's also now, obviously, working Doing, with the MCU. Uh, and three. Yes, and, and then, you know, in the early 2000s, he was developing a Fantastic Four movie. Was he really? Yeah, before Tim Story. And, he, huh. he, like, the reason why he ended up leaving was because he wanted to set in the 1960s. Oh. You like, you know, the Beatles' Hard Day's Night version of uh, Fantastic Four. Interesting. That's cool. That would have been cool. And I'm, been I'm, cool. I'm curious to see how they bring Marvel's first family into, into the MCU now. You think the cast of the Roger Corman movie will make cameos in this movie? I mean, if I have any say, please give them something. <laughs> they are going all in on the multiverse, so this could be kind of a multiverse, kind of Elseworlds, what if, you know, amalgam. Yeah, oh. they've got Chris Evans, so, you know. <laughs> they do have Chris Evans, that's true. Put him back in there and, uh, and see what happens. But yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> it's weird. I'm excited to see uh, what could be my second favorite Fantastic Four movie come out in the near future. Who are going to cast? Like that's what I want to know. Like, who what? would you cast? Who would be your ideal? Well, I, I mean, I'm all for the you know John Krasinski, uh, Emily Blunt uh, fan fiction that's been going around the internet forever. I love that idea. Uh, I'm John, okay on it. What you're okay on it? I'm soft on it. Yeah, what do you? I know? was fine with Krasinski until that whole good news thing. That's a great show. Was, was it? it was, was it? I like. And then it. he sold it for all this money. Yeah, oh, he good sold for it for you, John Krasinski. Congratulations, <laughs> you invented the idea of good news. <laughs> Give him the money. You know, in regards to Johnny Storm, though, I don't know. There's so many actors. I mean, I I would have said like a Zac Efron if he was younger. I guess. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Maybe the kid that, well, he can't do that because I was going to say the kid that played Kick-Ass, but he was... Uh, he was Quicksilver. Quicksilver. So that can't work. You know? And he's older now. I believe yeah. he's, you know, probably pushing 30. He's got to be, yeah. It'd be cool if they did a 17, 18-year-old Johnny Storm. Yeah. Real I mean, teenager. Like the to way. make him close to the same age as Peter Parker would be mm-hmm. kind of cool because they're friends in the comics. That could work. That'd be neat. You know, and for the thing, I don't know. I have no idea who they could cast for him. Like, it's that's so hard. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, he almost has to have that kind of New York tough guy attitude, which I think they never really nail in any of the movies. No. You don't cast that New York guy uh, with like that Jack Kirby kind of accent that's what i would push for i'd push for like a real new york guy now who that is right now i'm not 100 percent sure i don't even know i could probably cast this in the 90s pretty easily but now in 2020 you know you might hate this suggestion okay 
but he's kind of similar aged to what I would pick would be John Krasinski is like, and, and his other Marvel movie that he wanted to do never happened, but Channing Tatum to play Ben Grimm and then become the thing. That's not bad. That's not bad. Did you ever see a guide to recognizing your saints? The story of no, Kings, no, I never that saw that movie. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of Channing Tatum's early roles, and he's very New York-y in that. Yeah, I, I, so I could see had, that. He has kind of a New York feel. I could see that. Yeah, plus he's um, beautiful, and if he gets turned into a rock monster, you could feel his pain. Yes, you like this it, poor you, beautiful you would man. Feel the vanity, you know, and then the you know hideousness of of the thing. Yes, I just hope they don't fully CGI the thing and make it like. It's got to be something that feels real, you know? I don't want it to look like the rock monster that was in Fan 4 Stick, you know? Yeah, I mean, almost the, the kind of, I guess the MCU equivalent right now is Korg yeah, from yeah. Ragnarok. But that, he's not as, you don't get that human emotion from Korg. That's true. That you get from, that you want to get from the thing. So it's going to be an interesting you know, I can't wait to see how, how this all develops and I do too. You know, who I, they cast. I want to know if they come from another Earth or if they, you know. Yeah. It, it's there's got to be a lot of combinations. I mean, they're doing Secret Invasion now, um, but Secret Invasion is going to be on TV. Does that mean that yes. Secret Wars is going to be the next big Marvel trilogy or whatever, like the Avengers stuff? I don't know. I don't know. And you know, the Skrulls are such a huge part of the Fantastic Four universe. Yeah. I mean, you know, they were, they debuted in the Fantastic Four, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. I mean, the Skrulls, uh, the Inhumans, a mm-hmm. lot of major characters stemmed from Fantastic Four lore. Black Panther. Yeah, Black Namor. Yeah. Well, Namor's, you know, the one of the first. 30s, yeah, but 40s. he, I mean, he was one of the invaders, but he was also a big, uh, you know, Yes. Ally slash enemy of the Fantastic Four in many cases. Yeah, they brought back. And, and Spider-Man. Spider-Man was, was always trying to get to join the Fantastic yeah. Four, which could be a fun little angle, especially now with John Watts doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really interesting. Like, they could do a lot of stuff with this. If they do it right, it could be the Fantastic Four we've waited for since 1994. I, I, I'm thrilled. I, I'm thrilled. And I hope movie theaters are back by then so that I, I can so see too. it with a crowd. I'll go to Connecticut. We'll go see it together. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm going to see this one multiple times. At least four. I'm sure, oh, I'm, well, there you go. And without further ado, let's dive into episode three of the Roger Corman Fantastic Four miniseries. Thanks for watching. Greetings, geeks, and welcome back to part three of our mini-series on the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie that doesn't exist. In this part, we're going to be covering a lot of the visual effects and some of the more questionable elements of the movie, as well as a lot of stuff about the documentary, Wizards miniseries. At this point, we also start getting our first look at the costumes, the actual Fantastic Four costume. And a lot of people crap on the costume, say they look so bad. But they literally say in the movie that Sue made them. Yes, they do. are the Fantastic Four, remember? Now we're more like the Terrific Three. He'll be back. Yes. So, if they're not perfect, you have to assume 
she's not necessarily a seamstress. She made them out of materials that she found. Like, okay, I buy that. They're not like, you know, the Fantastic Four costumes in the other movies, the aforementioned movies that, you know, we have mixed feelings about. Those are clearly made by, no, Reed didn't make those. Like they're just, they're manufactured by some sort of professional designer company or whatever. Like they're not homemade. Like Peter Parker's costume of Spider-Man is homemade. You know, it's not what it is in the other Fantastic Four movies, the uh, Spider-Man movies and so on and so forth, you know? Yeah, and you know, again, as as a kid, when I saw those costumes, you it's know, off the pages, head, head explosion, because you know we had seen the the uh, the Spider Man TV movie, which did have the costume. But besides that, I mean, Punisher, they ran away from the costume; they didn't want to show the costume at all. Uh, Daredevil in Trial of the Incredible Hulk, he's wearing a black ninja jumpsuit. Yeah. So to see this, and also the Captain America movie, and and they basically give you the comic book version of it. Yeah. Like I it's, think, it's, I think they look cool. Yeah. I thought they looked great. I really did like them a lot. This and not the Captain America with the clear shield and the, and the helmet, but the yeah. one that I watched with, with Adam, they're literally like, they pulled those things off the pages. The Matt Salinger, Captain yeah. America. Yeah. Can I just tell you a quick story and, and you don't have to use this? Sure. I have a, I'll, no, n- nothing is getting cut out, period. Okay. <laughs> We're going all the way. There's a, there's a, there's a coffee, uh, or there's a town near my house called Wilton. And uh, I went there to see a movie with my wife and, and daughter. Our son wasn't born yet. And we went to get Starbucks before. We're standing in line at Starbucks. There's a tall guy in front of me. I'm like waiting for my coffee. The guy turns around. It's Matt Salinger in Connecticut. I guess really? he lives around here. Wow. I freaked the hell out. <laughs> your, wife, like, oh. your wife did one of these, like, oh boy, here we like, go. <laughs> like, what are you, what are you, what, like, what, what's going on with you? I'm like, I can't, I can't talk. I can't, talk. I can't I'll tell you outside. I'll tell you outside. I'm like, that's Matt Salinger. He played Captain America in the 1990 movie. She's like, who? <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh, you should have said hi to him. I'm like, he's, uh, don't you understand the level of He's a legend. <laughs> it's, it's Jack Nicholson. Al Pacino yeah. and him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I, I have a obviously I have a real soft spot in my heart for all these early yeah. Marvel movies. And uh, but again, yeah. like this was a movie that if you took a comic book and you want to make it into a movie, it's panel for panel, page for page, like it came out of a comic book. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they've never done the, these characters on screen better than this movie. Yeah. So now I'm kind of drawing a blank. How do they rescue Alicia? Do, do they bring her to do, like, how did that all transpire? I'm kind of yeah, foggy now, on it. Now you're making me think about it, a movie that I love. I don't rec- I, it's coming up. I'm, it's, on, it's on a repeat here. But they save her. That's they save her, right? But they don't uh, like. I don't remember how it happens, but like, Hold on. they find her, they save her, then they, you know, but they 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 save her after they go after Victor Von Doom, don't they? Or is it before? I think it's okay. So hold on. He breaks it out. You know what? They never show it on screen. They never show it, right? No, they never show it on screen. Doom gets her from. Oh no. oh, no. No, no. Doom kidnaps her. her. Yeah, That's what it is. Doom kidnaps her from the jeweler. And by happenstance, when the Fantastic Four take their, you know, Fantastic Four ship, which is already built magically, sure, whatever. Okay, fine. He's whatever. He's good. Yeah, he built it in, in about 45 minutes. Sure. I like, they, how, I like how he has like this crappy spaceship capsule. Yeah. But- he built this beautiful, fantastic car. Yeah, that it flies from New York City to what's it like, Lactavia or whatever it is yeah. called. Yeah, their their spacesuits are made from the top of a Jiffy Pop uh, <laughs> container. <Yeah. laughs> but they built a fantastic car in this. It's like time. in a matter of about forty five minutes. You know, he used those arms and legs real fast, moving around to build something. <laughs> so they go to Doom's castle, and you know. They know they have to defeat him because he comes on. Somehow he 
connects to their lab and tells them his whole plot. What he's yes. going to do. He does the as, classic like Doctor Evil. Yeah, as all villains on do. Screen. They tell you the whole their whole plan. So they fly there. They go in. They they start beating up the bad guys. But what's funny about it is they're very honest in the sense that they say, "Listen, we just got these powers. We don't really know how to use them. They're not he, They're not Batman. They're not." you know, martial artist or whatever. They're like, how are we going to fight all these people? And and they come right out and say it, which I was like, wow, thank you. Like they didn't just magically know how to fight. And, mm-hmm. and I was really glad about that. They were honest and they were like, listen, we're scientists and nerds or whatever. We're not here. You know, we're not heroes yet. And that was pretty cool. Yes. Yes. Then they, well, get, yeah. then they get captured, which would make sense because, again, they're not superheroes yet. They have superpowers, but they're not superheroes yet. And this is where the movie takes its notorious turn because so much of the CGI happens in this last 15 minutes of the movie or so, which is, you know the worst CGI of the movie, period. Maybe we got here early enough to buy ourselves some time. Now listen to me, gang. I want you to keep your eyes open. Johnny, I'm going to see if I can figure out a way to disarm this laser. Pitiful. It doesn't make the movie bad. It just looks cheesy. So they have this like force field that perfectly drops over the four of them. And they're kind of like shaking back and forth trying to escape. Then they get like electrocuted and they're jostling back and forth. And, you know, mm-hmm. they're told to do that because they're actors and whatever. And yes, does it look cheesy? Of course it does. Is it not the greatest you know, acting, again, they worked with what they had in the script. Is it edited badly? No, it's not edited badly. The visual effects aren't great, but that's, they literally did this with no money. They were making, at this point, they were making this movie out of their own pockets. Yes, but just just to say a word about the editing, the editor is a guy named Glenn Garland who went on to edit all of Rob Zombie's movies. Oh, really? So every Rob Zombie movie has been edited by Glenn Garland. That's cool. That's interesting. He's great. And the way they figure out how to get out of the force fields is hilarious and awesome, but also believable. How do yeah. they get out? Reed slips his little foot, little foot bootsy under Underneath. the force field. 
and extends his foot and kicks over the, you know, the, the, the Ray the, thing. <laughs> the Ray thing, obviously. But it's very cartoony. It's very cartoony. But again, right out of a comic or something you'd see him do. Like, Straight out of it. It's, it's like, this is one of the most comic book honest films I've seen. You know, yep. like they really tried to recreate a comic book. Um, they get out, they fight, you know, they, they beat up all the bad guys. Sue does her invisible thing and goes invisible and two guys machine gun each other. And I'm like, <laughs> well, the Fantastic Four historically don't try to kill people, but this Fantastic Four kills a lot of people. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if at the end you found out Sue was like this homicidal maniac? She's just like, like, <laughs> like a serial killer. Yeah. She's just like a total murderer. <laughs> That'd be but, a twist. But it's, it's, it makes sense. It's fine. Like, again, it's, it's a superhero origin story. They don't know fully how to use their powers yet. They don't know their limitations or whatever. Right now, their goal is defeat the bad guy, destroy the ray that's going to blow up New York City and, you know, get out of there alive. So Doom shoots off this beam of energy Mm -hmm. out of this giant telescope, essentially. And this is where Johnny finally becomes the full-blown human torch. I can't. I've been wanting to blow up that destructor way since I was a kid, huh? Blame on! this point he's just like throwing fireballs out of his hands or out of his boogers and he he does the flame on and it looks like the lawnmower man it's okay so let's talk about this because this is a big deal the big deal this is this is probably i feel like everyone's biggest complaint about the movie yes is this two and a half minutes of the film and you know to go back to before I'd seen it, I think everybody I, like that I knew that was excited for this movie was looking at the promotional material, the pictures, the trailer, and saying, does he ever turn into the Human Torch or right. is he just Johnny Storm? Because um, Human Torch was probably the biggest member of the Fantastic Four, I would say, at this point in the 90s. Oh, in the 90s, he was the most popular Fantastic Four character, bar none. Yes. Absolutely. I mean... He's touted as Spider-Man's best friend. Like he does a lot of crossovers with, with Spider-Man and other characters and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, he was, yeah, just like you said. And I would love to see that relationship in the MCU at some point. But yeah, so basically when I first saw this movie and I saw that scene, I was just like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like this looks terrible it's it's a cross between tron and lawnmower man yes but it, it doesn't like i couldn't even describe it because you know the, the city looks empty it looks like it looks like almost like you know the beginning of a of a genesis game 
Yes. The opening screen where you very see eight open. eight bit like low low res you know low yeah. pixel count kind of thing. It's and then Johnny he says I've been wanting to blow up that destructor way since I was a kid, which is a weird thing for a kid to want to do. I, I don't know why you'd want because to... they just learned that it existed as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's strange. Uh, and then he just like punches the ray. He gets zapped a bunch of times and he punches it and it be- creates like this big spray of particles. Yeah. And that's that. And so I, yeah, when I first saw this movie, you know, I was going through that. I love mo- like, you know, the pure cinema kid phase and Scorsese mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I was like, oh, geez, this is, this part's cheesy. This thing's cheesy. But I, I still liked it, but I was just like, yeah, this is a little cheesy. And now knowing the story where they had been duped by a special effects guy. Yeah. Who had told them. Again, uh, it's in the documentary. And it's yes. very interesting. The, 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 how they talk about this whole sequence, which is only maybe about five to seven minutes of the documentary, is very interesting. And it's like very compelling to listen to the story. Yeah, and they go into more detail in it in the book Forsaken. But essentially, they had paid a guy who said he worked... They said he said he worked on Independence Day, right? Yes. Which makes no sense in terms of the timeline, because Independence Day came out in 1996. After, yeah. So I don't know what they're talking... I don't know if it's a different movie that they just got mistaken. But he said he could do it, and he was incapable of doing it. Yeah. And then they had to take whatever remained and go to a company called Mr. Film and get the fil- and get the effects redone and get but by that point the budget was so drained by giving this one effects guy the money that so much money very very little left and so it's a bummer know, it's a bummer um it's not it's not great but it's it's the same as any other bad ending to a superhero movie that they don't know how to end yeah so, like, you know, look at the Rise of the Silver Surfer one. You know, you have the Galactus Cloud, and then they just poof it out of existence almost. Or the mega-budget Green Lantern movie with Ryan Reynolds, which I love Ryan Reynolds. I think he's a great actor. I thought he was a really good Hal Jordan. I thought Blake Lively was a really good Carol Ferris. But the ending of that movie is another one where they just kind of, like, Poof it out of existence because they, yeah. they, they, they don't know how to end it. And it's I, ha- I hate it. Yeah, I hated that one. No, it's not a great movie. It's not a great movie, but he's. It's fine. At the time, he was good at it, what I thought. Um, fine. This is another one that they, they, they didn't know how to end it. Well, you know, it's a case of hindsight being 2020, right? I would have thought, personally, if I was the director, if Johnny was able to break that green beam into a million pieces. Yep. The pieces that rain down create more superheroes. More That'd be cool. That would have been cool. Because that could have led to a sequel and you would have had newer villains. Maybe it made the Inhumans or something. Who knows? Whatever. It would have been clever. But again, this was just, they needed to have some sort of, you know, splashy ending and this is what they did. So now, they go from uh, uh, Lactavia or whatever the country's called or Doom is from. Latveria. That's what it's called, yes. Uh, to New York City. Latvian Orthodox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to New York City in two seconds and they break the thing up. Now, Reed and Doom are fighting each other and they're duking it out. And, and then Reed knocks Doom over to the side of the, of the castle. Yeah. He's holding on to him for dear life but holding onto the metal glove, they have this kind of back and forth dialogue. And, you know, they kind of say that like Victor is dead and, you know, it's only doom now, which is something that Dr. Doom would say. Yes. Yes, Totally. Like most of the dialogue that doom has in this movie is stuff that doom would say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yes. And and then doom falls into the abyss, which is kind of a bummer. I'm like, you know, but they they put the the metal glove down on the ledge and then the mm-hmm. fingers start to move. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
not think for a moment. I shall have a rest until I have what is rightfully mine. <laughs> Here's to the future, my friend. Let's go home. Let's hope we have a home to go to. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that. I've been waiting for you to talk, talk about this. A few things here. First of all, and when I, when I first saw this, I thought this was hilarious that Doom asks for help and Reed's pulling him up and then Doom's like nope. crapping on him while he's, while he's pulling him up. He's like, oh, you fool. You're so weak. Of course you'd pull me up. It's like, Doom, <laughs> let him save your life and then give him the spiel. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, in the Hero Illustrator review, which was the first review I read of this in like 94. Oh, boy. They did, they did point out, they spoiled this, that... Uh, Dr. Doom dies by falling off a building, which happened in like every superhero movie in the 80s. Ever, you know, yeah. The Joker fell off a building. Skeletor fell off a building. Uh, Dick, uh, Big Boy Caprice fell off of a building. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the cliche of the time. Yeah. I don't know why the glove is still moving. Is it like, so, like some kind of Doom bot or? Because, I mean, they just, the, the, the goons we mentioned, like they just yes. put the armor on him. Like they don't, like, it's not like psychically linked to his brain. Uh, they don't establish it. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and I think they're going for some big, oh, moment. Yeah. Oh, he's still alive. But they don't, you know, set that up in any way. I don't know yeah. if that was something that got cut out of the script. for Again, it's a probably time and budget. Cut a, you know, cutting room floor kind of situation, which is fine. Yeah. So, yeah. now, so now, you know, they've beat the bad guy. They've taken out all the goons. Moments later, we're at Reed and Sue's wedding. Yes, and it's beautiful. It's, it's magnificent. It's if beautiful. I could have worn a, a, a Fantastic Four outfit to my wedding, I would have. Now, here's the gripe. There's a couple gripes, but okay, I I know where the, I know exactly where this is going, and I can't you wait. You don't. Oh my goodness. Okay. You're not. So they established that Reed figured out where their powers came from. Yes. But coming out of the church, the thing is still the thing. Mm -hmm. But he's got Alicia, the person that he loves, and they say the reason why he's the thing is because he doesn't know how to love or whatever. Why is he still the thing then? If he's got the girl. So you're going to, I just, I, I don't, I mean, this is like, these are all Stanley Jack Kirby things, you know, I guess. I don't know. He would always go from the thing back to Ben, back to the thing. Back to Ben. So he did, back in the day, transition from one, one version of himself to the other. Yeah. He, like, 
nowadays he's just the thing 100 percent of the time period it was i mean it was always a plot device like if you know if, if they were fighting uh, mole man and they needed thing to be weak for a scene mole man would knock his powers off of him and he'd be ben Grimm. oh sorry reed i can't help you i'm back to good old ben really Interesting. yeah yeah so that was kind of just one of those standard so, plot cliches of the Kirby okay. Lee era fair enough Fine. yeah Whatever. well now they they don't set that up very well in the movie. I will admit that. That's fine. Whatever. It was the end. They were wrapping up. Whatever. Yeah. You know, this is something that's, that's talked about in the documentary as well, is Reed and Sue get in the limo to mm-hmm. drive away, and then there is the wacky, inflatable wind man. Yep. Out of the sunroof, you see Reed's fake, you know, arm going back and forth. Yes. Okay. I love it. Is it bad? Yes. But is it kind of cute? It's kind of cute too. They they crap on it in the documentary and they'd be like, oh, that's not great. But again, it's they worked with what they had and I didn't hate it. I did not hate it. It was good. It's fine. You know. It's a Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. You know, at a certain point you just gotta roll with the punches. Here's the thing. You know what? Even though it's touted as a Roger Corman film, it's really an Ole Sasson film. That's true. It has, other than maybe some of the money coming from Roger Corman, it's not a Roger Corman film, period. It's just, that's the studio that it was produced by or whatever, but it's it's not really his... I, I don't like that they call it that because he didn't really do much for the movie other than that's true. give them some money. And that's what's weird about all these bootlegs I have is they all do say Roger Corman presents the Fantastic Four, the unreleased movie, even they, the one through Doom says Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. Right, because no one knows who Ole Sasson is. Yes. That's basically unless, unless I've seen Blood Fist 3. Right, but no one has, period, unfortunately. <laughs> it was um, on Amazon Prime. I watched it recently. <laughs> Of course you did. Of course you did. <laughs> he did a great job. He's a great director. He did a great job. And like he's he's a kind of guy that me as a filmmaker, I'd love to sit down and have a conversation about making low budget films with him. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think he'd have a lot of interesting stories and just like ideas to talk to people about for making low budget films. I yes. think it'd be a really interesting conversation. Well, and and what shows uh for him and for everybody is this wasn't just a job for hire. This wasn't obviously a cash grab because they weren't making this a lot of cash. This was like, I love comic books. I want to do this movie. This could be a huge opportunity for my career. Which yep. any young filmmaker, when they're said, hey, we're going to give you a million bucks to make a movie. If you said no, you'll never get a phone call again. Yeah. Period. Yeah. yeah. And even beyond that, they did things that were beyond their own right. jobs, it, it beyond was the nine to five of it. Way outside the scope of what they really would have done. If it was a real studio film, this would have, you know, it, they would have not put the blood, sweat, and tears into this movie that they really did. And that just shows, and they, they say it over and over again in the actual documentary, they all cared about this movie a lot and they wanted to see it be seen. They didn't care that it was seen in 2000 theaters or whatever. They just wanted it to be seen. And that's very interesting. And, you know, they could have been just like so disgusted by the whole process that it just said, you know what, be done with it. I move on my life and do something else. But they actually cared about it, which is very interesting. Even yeah. the actors, they all yeah. talk about it and they care about mm-hmm. it. And I think a lot of that speaks to Ole Sassoon, who was the, you know, the captain of the ship and by, by everyone's accounts made it a pleasant experience, made it something that they were all proud to be working on and excited yeah. to be working on. Uh, you know, you, we've, we've both worked in enough stuff where sometimes the production is awful. Yeah. And then sometimes the production is great and you're all like, you know, bouncing up and down. You can't wait to see the finished product. And then sometimes that finished product isn't very good, even though the production was great. And I worked on a couple of films where it was so much fun to make. 
and came out like I thought it was shot beautifully, you know, either if I was the DP on it or there are certain movies that I've actually played parts in the movie and mm-hmm. acted in it. And the director or the producer or whatever, like it, it bums me out when they're like, let's not make it, let's not show it. And I'm like, I did a documentary in college about um, the Jersey devil. Oh yeah. And it was so much fun to make. And I was, you know, producer slash second camera operator on it. And we shot hours and hours and hours of film on this thing. And the director just never finished editing it. And I was like, for years, I'm like, give me the footage. Yeah. It'd just be fun to just throw it out on the internet and make it and just see what happens. And it bummed me out. And it was a couple other smaller projects that I worked on that I'm like, I want to see this thing be out there somewhere. And it just, you know, they don't, they just, uh, I, I did it. I didn't like it. I, I shelved it and that's it. And I'm just yeah. bummed. You know. and, 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 you know, that's what's heartbreaking about that documentary is you get the sense that everybody um, loved making it and wanted to see it get Be released. Something. And, yeah. and, and to, this, to this day, I can't believe it's been 25 years plus and they still have not released an official version of this. It's weird. It's, it's, it's like they want you to not know about it, but they're still, it's still out there. And, you know... I don't know if this podcast will ignite anything about it, but it might cause people to look for it a little bit more. Um, it's just, you know, overall, I, it's it's not the worst film I've ever seen in my life at all. Not even by cl- a long shot. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's it's very true to being a comic book. It's a, It's a very interesting movie. The acting is is great in a lot of parts. I mean, every char- every actor really sold their characters well. Mm-hmm. It's just unfortunate that it didn't make, uh, you know, a splash, if you will. Yes, agreed, agreed. And I, I truly think that if they ever did find that negative, if it's not burned, and they do release a, a pristine-looking version of this, that Just when imagine, people start, like, yeah, they, they could digitally remaster anything these days. Yes, yeah. you know, like they're they're doing a, a, a Francis Ford Coppola is releasing a director's cut of Godfather Part Three, digitally remastered on Blu-ray. That it is drastically different than the film we saw in theaters. Like I, I heard that on Box Office Thirty, actually. Yeah, I know because I talked about it's it. The <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I it's saw it on Target. Better. I saw it on Target. I was like, "Whoa!" I pre-ordered the thing. <laughs> it's pretty great. But, I wonder what he's going to do because Godfather Three doesn't work it doesn't at all. Work. It doesn't work. But, so. but it's like apparently there's a whole other ending to Al Pacino's story. Okay. And he hated the way that the the studio made him cut it, that he redid it. But if, if they can redo that movie, which is hated by people. Yes. Hated. Yes. The way it bastardizes Godfather part one and Godfather part two. And they're like, you know what? We're going to throw you money to recut this thing and make a better ver. I mean, look what, you know, HBO max is doing with justice league. They gave Zack Snyder, the ability to reshoot footage and make a four hour justice league, even though the theatrical version was such a train wreck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's fine. Can I just say that this movie is better than the justice league movie that it's they be- wasted so much time and money on this movie is leaps and bounds it's, above that terrible justice league movie it's better than justice league it's better than batman v superman it's better yep. than um amazing spider-man 2 yep um it's better than thor the dark world yep oh my god that movie sucks the movie it's better sucks. Than, than, <laughs> uh, than electra it's better, oh, better than, than electra um I, though people hate the ben affleck daredevil i like that movie this is probably equal, if not I'd put it a, way much higher than that. A, a bit higher above that Daredevil movie. Um, uh, it's not good. I I think Trial of the Incredible Hulk is the best Daredevil movie, but that's just my thing. <laughs> we should. When did that movie come out? Nineteen eighty nine. 
I know it's it's pre Wizard, but we should do that one too. That I haven't watched be, that in a long time. I would be interested in rewatching that movie. That's that, a, I, yeah. I remember seeing that on TV, and you know that and the one of the the death of the Incredible Hulk when he falls yes. out of the helicopter. Yep. Yeah, with with kind of like the fake Black Widow character. Yeah, I would rewatch those, and I'd love to talk about those again. That'd be I've cool. got them on DVD, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. I gotta find them. now. Now I gotta find them. They're gonna find some like, like you know, They're region cheap, region they? six version of it. <laughs> they should be cheap. I'm sure they are. But isn't that crazy that we live in a world where you can get all these things on Blu-ray and DVD? I mean, some like you know, like labels like Vinegar Syndrome and Scream Factory. They're bringing up these movies that. Like five people saw on VHS. That's true. In the 1980s, maybe, and they're <laughs> they're like giving them the most remastered, pristine cuts you can like get you know, versions yeah. of them, and I'm so happy for it. But damn it, give me Fantastic Four already. I mean, this Fantastic Four movie, not to crap on the Funko Pop you have behind you, mm. but it's better than the Green Hornet movie with Seth Rogen. Yes. Well, this is the <laughs> this is the TV show. So. Yes, I know that. I know. So. But yes. I just happened to see that. I was like, you know what? I, I got to point it out. Like, this movie is a lot better working with a lot less yep. than movies that had budgets of 150, 200, 250 million dollars to make. It's better it's, than Ghost Rider, oh, Ghost Rider 2, those, Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, those movies are awful. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you know what movie that it's, I'd say it's, equal to you know it's better than punisher war zone yes i don't know if it's better than the thomas jane punisher which i really like okay but it's it's on the same level okay with that okay interesting now now we've we've talked now for quite a bit of time we've covered a lot of information yes Uh, you know we don't need to just like dive into documentary because we've talked about it a lot but i need to know our final thoughts. Do you want me to go first or you go first? I can, it's your podcast. I'll go, I'll go first and you can have the final word. Okay. Sounds good. So final word on the, uh, or on the documentary and the whole thing. Okay. Well, just to sum it up, this to me is my favorite Marvel movie, my favorite Marvel thing ever. When I think about who I was in seventh grade, that kid sitting in his room alone, reading comic books, dreaming of something more. This movie was such a big part of it because Fantastic Four was my favorite comic book. And I saw the trailer for this movie and it made me want to see the movie. And it made me become one of those guys, one of those kids that would go to the video store and try to seek out weird, crazy movies, like the kind of offbeat stuff. Mm -hmm. And, And that's been such a part of my life as an adult, you know, as you've seen, I have a whole shelf of videos behind me. That quest for, for this thing that you want and people telling you, or like, you know, there, there being barriers between you and something that you want. The thrill mm-hmm. of the hunt, you're looking for a toy or a video. Oh yeah, we uh, all know the thrill of the childhood. hunt. You're going to Goodwills, thrift stores, comic book stores. This was a pre-internet era and Fantastic Four, the movie, was a bootleg movie that I had to search for for four years before I finally found it. So it's just like so much of my life was wrapped up in, in this movie. Uh, so much of my youth from, you know, middle school to the end of high school that it's such, it's like such a part of my childhood. Um, and I think it's why I, I still love these Marvel movies is because I saw that trailer on Carnosaur and it just made me think, wow, th- these Marvel movies can be big. You can, like, these characters can be brought to life. This was the first time you saw a movie with, I mean, besides, this was like the first time you saw a movie with multiple superheroes. A superhero team that's predated X-Men by six years. Easily. Yeah. Predated Generation X by, you know, two or three years. So they were on the cusp of, of Marvel being this kind of cinematic uh, juggernaut. 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 Uh, and yeah, this, 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 this is just a perfect movie for me. I, uh, yeah, I just love it. And the documentary is fantastic too. Okay. So 
like I said, I had never seen this movie until recently. I literally finished it three days ago. <laughs> and um, I watched the documentary and I finished it yesterday. This is a movie that if you're a fan of this podcast, if you're a fan of comic book movies, if you're a fan of comics, you should see this movie. I think it's very, very well done. You have to go into it with the mindset that this is based on the origins and archetypes of the Fantastic Four. This is not what you're reading now in 2020 or even what you may have been reading in the 90s version of the characters. This is as true to what Jack Kirby and Stan Lee envisioned. This is it. And it's like you're coming off the pages of the comic book in a movie. Spot on with, if you know anything about film, no money to make, which is unbelievable. I think the documentary is almost more interesting than the movie itself. And I do enjoy documentaries, but I tend to get bored toward the middle, like in the middle of the second act. This thing I was glued to. I could not watch enough of it. I wanted to see more. And I think everybody should watch it. And if this little podcast creates some sort of buzz about this movie and it's somehow down the road gets a DVD or a Blu-ray release of official version of it. Wow. Fantastic. Again, it's, you know, it'd be pretty cool. So overall I give this movie, if I had to grade it and we've been doing this with comics, I know yours would be an A plus <laughs> plus plus. <laughs> I would give this a solid a minus. Okay because looking past the bad CGI, looking at it as strictly a comic book film that they tried to make a comic book on screen, they hit it. There are certain things that don't work, like, but again, that could have been cutting room floor stuff, edited for time. They shot the movie in 18 days. What do you expect? So I, I can't, I can't judge them for that. So I give it an A minus and see the movie. And with that, Stephen, thank you so much for taking this cinematic journey with me. I really appreciate you exposing me to this as well as joining me on this conversation. Anything you want to promote or post or, or talk about before we, we say goodbye? No, well, I just want to say thank you for having me. Like from the moment we started talking on this podcast, we've been talking about doing this specific Fantastic Four podcast, and I'm so thrilled it came together, and I thank you for having me on. Well, I'm glad I had to get through Generation X in order to do this, <laughs> which is great. And that was part three of our ongoing mini-series of the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. Stay tuned next week when we bring Adam on to get his thoughts on the movie and the overall mythos behind the idea of this project that doesn't exist. And as always, until next time, don't forget to keep your books bagged and boarded.